Breaking news, Canon has officially launched the R5 Mark II, long awaited. And I think it's one of the greatest cameras ever made, but I'm probably also the only reviewer who's going to say this. This is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. I will give you an objective, unbiased viewpoint on the new camera, its strengths and its weaknesses. But first, I wanna thank our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace makes websites incredibly easy. You do not have to be technical to have your own domain name. Set up a beautiful website for your photography portfolio, your video reel, your online store, your personal project, whatever you can imagine. Head to squarespace.com slash Tony to get a free trial. No credit card, no messing around with that. Just set it up, see how easy it is. And when you love it, you can save yourself 10% by using the coupon code Tony. Thanks for sponsoring us, Squarespace, and making this possible. The Canon R5 Mark II is a full frame mirrorless camera and it's kind of the ultimate hybrid camera. It is kind of the best camera for most of us because it's capable of doing everything. It does amazing portraits, 45 megapixels for beautiful landscapes, plenty of dynamic range. It shouldn't have any of those limitations, but it can also do action. Things like wildlife with lots of croppability and really good quality for sports with 30 frames per second. But it's also an amazing video camera like its predecessor. It has great video features and a flip screen and it addresses a lot of the weaknesses. I pre-ordered it right away and I saved myself $415 by using this link to go to Adorama because I always shop at Adorama. I had some VIP points and then I used my Adorama credit card to save an additional 5% off and that's how I managed to save myself $415 pre-ordering it. The camera has 45 megapixels just like the predecessor. So that's not an improvement but that sensor was excellent. But for those of you shooting sports or wildlife, this now supports 30 frames per second raw, silently. And that's a big step up from the original R5, which only did 20 frames per second. The new R5 Mark II also sports pre-capture. So you press the shutter and it can go back half a second in time and save those 15 images. And that's, that's really useful for especially wildlife photographers. And they're bringing that feature to video too. So especially for wildlife video, you don't have to continually record waiting for an animal to do something. That's what I have to do today with the Z9 that I use for wildlife video. I'm excited about this because when that animal strikes, when the animal does something interesting, as long as I have it in focus in the viewfinder, I can hit the record button and it will go back in time three to five seconds and save that. And it's gonna save me so much footage. Now, the downside to that pre-recording with the video is the camera is essentially internally always recording video. So it's generating a lot of heat and could very well overheat. But we'll talk about some of the ways that Canon is managing that in just a little bit. Now jumping from 20 to 30 frames per second might not seem like a big deal, but Canon has greatly improved the readout speed compared to the original R5 by building in the stacked sensor. The readout speed in the original R5 was enough of a problem that we stopped using it for wildlife because we had several what would have been good shots that were ruined by rolling shutter. And in fact, one of Chelsea's hummingbird photos was ruined so weirdly that it inspired me to make an entire video on the concept of rolling shutter because I don't think people understood the importance of it. Now, of course, everybody's figured that out because every camera manufacturer just keeps cranking up the readout speeds. But the readout speed of the original R5 was 1 60th of a second or about 16 milliseconds. It's down to about six milliseconds with the new version. And that should mean that silent electronic shutter is going to be so much more useful. It still does not match cameras like the Nikon Z8, which is cheaper than Nikon Z9 or the Sony A1, which are all about one two fiftieth of a second or three to four milliseconds. They're, they're very close. Now, are you gonna see a huge difference? No, there's some point when the readout speed is fast enough that you don't really appreciate any more difference. And I think while the R5 Mark II is close to that, you shouldn't often have a problem. The R5 Mark II inherits some traits from the R3, like the electronic viewfinder. It now has the eye controlled AF. We tested this in the R3. I'm filming on an R3, by the way. We tested this on the R3 and it was cool, but I found to get it to work properly, I had to recalibrate it every time I went out to use the camera. Like it'd be good for an evening when I went out, but the next day I'd have to also recalibrate it. And if I picked it up and forgot to recalibrate it, it would be unreliable, it would be focusing in the wrong place. And thus I considered it just not ready for professional use. I just considered it a gimmick, 
I permanently turned it off and stopped using it, even though the R3 is a great overall camera. The R5 Mark II says it's going to improve that, and the early reviews are saying, well, maybe it's still not great for everybody. As soon as we get our production copy in from Adorama, I will test it out, and I will be frank with you. If it is garbage and not worth paying for, I will absolutely tell you that. Canon, I don't know why they're doing this. They, they're they building in a bunch of AI features, like generative AI features. You have to take a picture, could be a raw file, and then you go back into the menu and you tell the camera to reprocess it and make a version with less noise. My question is, when would you ever do this? Like, if you're gonna just be sharing a 45 megapixel JPEG through your phone, through the app or something, you don't really need to do this. It's not gonna make that much of a difference. And if you're going to be putting it through your computer so you can make a big print or something where the difference in noise might be more visible, well then you probably just do the AI denoise in Lightroom or your other photo editing app, which is almost certainly gonna be more sophisticated because Adobe is always gonna have better AI than it could be possibly be built into a little camera like this because of cloud computing and all this. Given that it takes an extra workflow step where you stop and have to reprocess it, I just don't see the workflow use in that. I would always do it on my computer, but we're just getting started because this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. The Canon R5 will produce 180 megapixel JPEG files by taking a JPEG file, not, not a RAW file, does not work with RAW files, only works with JPEG files, and it just quadruples the resolution of it, doubles the width, it doubles the height, and how does it fill in everything in the middle? It uses generative AI, which is just the camera thinking it can uh, draw in some feathers and stuff, but it's garbage. It's, there's not really any sample pics, but DP Review put up a couple of sample pics and I zoomed in. And this is a picture of an owl, but it's just zoomed way in. And if you look, look how bad this is. That is not the shape of a feather. Look how a nice, straight, white owl feather suddenly became jagged, because AI is dumb. There's not a good AI up-res tool right now. But if you were gonna do AI up-res, you would definitely do it on your computer, right? Because there's lots of workflows that go straight from a camera to a phone to publishing but they don't need to be 180 megapixels. That stuff is probably also gonna be consumed on a smartphone. If you're doing 180 megapixels, it's only because you're doing a huge print and you're only really gonna be doing that on a computer. So why would you not just use upscaling on a computer if you wanted to do that? Okay, rant over. I hate the new AI features, but the camera does have a lot to like. First, like every new camera, they're advertising improved autofocus by making it more and more intelligent. They're recognizing more and more specific scenarios. So now they've programmed it to recognize soccer, basketball, and volleyball. Another feature I think is really dumb is Canon now allows you to register up to 10 people in the camera. You take pictures of their faces and you say, this is the top priority person, this is the second priority person. And if it sees that person in a future picture, it will focus on them instead of other people who might be in the frame. Now, the use case for this, you'd think it could be a wedding. So you might program the bride and the groom. And then if they're in the frame with a bunch of other people, it will focus on them. But again, I don't need that. All I do is I said, put the center autofocus point on the person I wanna focus on, and the camera will automatically jump to the face and eyes. And then I can freely recompose and track them as they move. Because there are lots of scenarios where a wedding photographer might not want to focus on the groom. You need to be able to tell it to focus on the maid of honor because she's doing something funny and she's gonna be in the foreground. You don't need, a, like, who would ever use this? And in fact, Sony cameras have had this feature for like more than 10 years and nobody ever uses it. Here's something that actually is useful. When you start getting into 30, 40 frames per second, you end up with a lot of pictures and some of them are in focus, some are out of focus. And you end up going through one by one to pick the ones that are in focus so that you can share the ones that are sharpest, right? Well, the camera will actually now detect the ones that are sharpest and add something in the metadata so that maybe when you import them into Lightroom, you can find it a little more easy and it could save you some time calling. Let's talk about the video features. The original R5 shot 8K at 30 frames per second, raw DCI, which means a wider format than the 16 by nine ratio that you're watching this in. The new one goes to 8K at 60 frames per second raw, so they've doubled the frames per second. It will also do 4K at 60 frames per second in S raw, which is just like a smaller raw format again in DCI. I'm, my hunch is these only record to one card and that's kind of the irony of this. Like if you're shooting 
8K at 60 frames per second raw, you're making huge files that consume massive resources that are gonna cost so much to store. It's a huge liability to, to be shooting something like a wedding and have it only, only go to one card because then if that card fails, you have no footage. There's not the throughput to write it to both cards because they didn't give fast CF Express Type B cards in both slots. Like the predecessor, the R5 Mark II has one CF Express Type B and one SD card. And that means the SD card always needs to be lower quality or it will become a bottleneck. And because RAW is so heavy and sort of expensive to store, they have given us 8K at 30 frames per second compressed. The R5 Mark II will also do extremely high quality 4K at 30 frames per second by scaling it down from 8K. It seems like if you want to do 4K at 60 frames per second, you either need to use the SRAW format, which is going to be heavier than a compressed format, or there must be a line skipped version that might be less sharp or have more noise but that's one of the things we'll test when i get our hands on the production copy soon hopefully we'll do 4k at 120 frames per second but that's sub sampled so it's skipping some pixels in order to do that fast readout but still that will give you eight times slow motion the r5 mark ii will do 4k at 120 frames per second sub sampled so like it's skipping some pixels you'll get more noise less sharpness but still you'll have four times slow motion or if you're willing to drop down to full HD like 1080, it'll do 240 frames per second or eight times slow motion. You can also do 4K video with like a 1.6 or 1.7 times crop, especially for wildlife photographers. Sometimes you need to zoom in. When the original R5 launched, overheating was a huge problem and Canon's done a lot to address that. Now 4K60 should record for over two hours. AK60 RAW will go for a full 18 minutes and you can extend those times by adding vertical grips now. One of the grips even has a fan in it, and that fan is pushing air through the R5 Mark II, allowing it to record much longer. The new R5 Mark II supports C-Log 2 for more dynamic range in video, and more importantly, to allow it to be compatible with Canon's cinema cameras. They have an interesting feature where you can record full HD video and use the shutter to snap individual stills. So you're getting 45 megapixel, I think JPEG stills at seven and a half frames per second while recording 1080 video. They've added a bunch of video features to make the workflow a little bit easier. Like they've added waveforms and false color and zebras, really useful for getting the most out of the dynamic range of a camera. They've also added a tally lamp to the front so whoever is on camera can see that the camera is actually recording. Canon's is launching three vertical grips with different features and different price points. And that's nice, you can kind of customize it and get the camera that you want. You can get for 350 bucks just a vertical grip that adds a couple of batteries and gives you vertical controls. Not a bad deal. There'll probably be third party versions for 100 bucks though, so you might just want to hold out. You can also get a version of the vertical grip that has Ethernet built in for $500, or if you're willing to give up the controls, like the vertical controls duplicated, you can get a vertical grip that has the fan built in that will allow the recording to go a little bit longer and that's 400 bucks and also includes an ethernet port some miscellaneous features to fill it out 1 250th of a second flash sync speed a little bit slower than sony a1 at 1 400th of a second but it's still respectable especially compared to like the nikon z8 a competitor which i think has a sync speed of 1 1 60th of a second because it lacks a mechanical shutter so in the studio this is going to be a significantly more powerful camera than a z8 or z9 the viewfinder is also much sharper than a Z, Z8 or Z9 with 5.7 million dots. But keep in mind, that's still not even full HD resolution. Nonetheless, it seems to be nice and bright and people seem to enjoy it. The camera itself is about a pound and a half, which means it's significantly lighter than a Z8 and even lighter than a Sony A1. It's lighter than the original R5. And I appreciate that Canon has started to add lightness, as Lotus would say, because when you carry this stuff around and you travel with it, every tenth of a pound really matters, especially if you're flying the camera on a gimbal for steady video. I'll quickly compare it to the competitors, but as a reminder, if you are gonna pre-order it, please use our link here that helps to support an independent reviewer who doesn't get early cameras from Canon. They didn't fly me out. I'll have to buy the camera on my own. But what I can do is promise you that it's gonna be an independent and objective review. Quickly, in comparison to the R5, it's significantly more expensive at $4,300 versus $3,000 new. So you can get an R5 for $2,500 used, and most people will not really see any difference in their pictures. But the new R5 II goes to 30 frames per second with the electronic shutter and mostly eliminates rolling shutter. It will also do 8K at 60 frames per second instead of just 30 frames per second. 
And if you care, it has that eye-controlled autofocus thing. The Nikon version of this is the Z8. Same megapixels, but the Z8 has a faster readout speed if you're worried about rolling shutter. Technically, the Z8 does 30 frames per second, but only in JPEG. If you shoot raw, it can only do 20 frames per second. So if you're a raw shooter, like I am for wildlife, I really need raw for wildlife, the R5 offers you 50% more frames, and that's a huge advantage. They both shoot 8K at 60 frames per second raw, but I think the R5 is going to be better for video because it has a flip screen. So if you ever have to film yourself, or if you have to set the camera up, or if you're doing a two or three camera shoot and you're the one camera operator, it can be really helpful to orient the flip screen in different ways so that you can more easily monitor it. I think that's going to make the R5 a better hybrid camera. And of course, the R5 Mark II is significantly lighter than the Nikon Z8, which is a real chonk and a pain to haul around everywhere. The R5 Mark II actually compares most closely to the Sony Alpha 1, which is Sony's flagship camera and is still $6,500 new. So the $4,300 price is actually really cheap, though A1s do go for about $4,600 used. At some point, the R5 Mark II will be available used also. They have about the same megapixels. They both do 30 frames per second raw. The A1 does have a faster readout speed, closer to the Z8, but I don't think most people are going to notice a difference in that. The A1 only does 8K at 30 frames per second, so it's behind the R5 when it comes to high-quality video. And the A1 only has a tilt screen, so you can't film yourself. And if you're a Sony shooter, like I am often, I need to bring the A1 for stills and I need to bring an A7S III for video just because the A7S III has a flip screen. With the R5, I could travel with one camera instead of two. It matches the A1 and it's a third cheaper. <laughs> that is a huge win for Canon. And those of you who are expecting a big leap, I'm sorry, but there are probably not going to be any other huge leaps in camera technology. We're going to see more and more niche autofocus algorithms that pick up different sports. The frames per second, the readout speed, those are going to keep improving. But I don't expect any huge leaps like we got from the 5D Mark I to the 5D Mark II, where the image quality and dynamic range and autofocus just improved exponentially. Now the gains are going to be 5% to 30% per generation. And they're kind of already at the point where most people don't even need what they have in the original R5. The good news is you might not have to worry about buying every new camera. The bad news is if you're like me and you get excited about gear, it's probably going to be a little less exciting. So maybe it's time to focus less on the gear and more about showing off your work, like setting up a portfolio at squarespace.com slash Tony. looks so much better than social media. The images fill the screen. I can control the layout. There's no ads, especially for my competitors. Instagram literally does that. Squarespace.com slash Tony is where you get your own professional portfolio with your own domain name. You can sell prints, take appointments from clients. Whatever you can dream of starts at Squarespace.com slash Tony. And when you love it, the coupon code Tony gets you 10% off. In the comments down below, tell me what you want me to test when we get our production R5 Mark II in. And are you excited for it? Are you ordering it? Or are you disappointed? Thanks and bye.